Uh, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about diversity, equity, and inclusion in hiring retention and in general in tech businesses. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Susie. Uh, you can say hi to me later. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the head of talent at Intergames, so I don't really work in the same sector as you do. I'm from the games industry, but I think we face quite similar challenge challenges when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and before my current role, I also served for three years as the volunteer network leader of our DEI network um, at my previous company. Uh, and during this time, I made a lot of learnings about how to make practices more inclusive, what works and what doesn't, and I want to share that with you today. Uh, I'll spend a very short time uh, on the why we need diversity and inclusion. First of all, our society is built on inequities that have influences on people's lives. Uh, and if we don't counteract that actively within our organizations, uh, we run in danger of either um, reflecting them or even making them worse. Um, also, diversity and inclusion helps us make better work. And I'll explain very briefly why I'm not going into too much detail because there's much better research about it than I can share with you. But if you just look at a McKinsey report um, about diversity executive leadership teams uh, compared to the national industry median, eth ethnically diverse teams performed uh, were 36% more likely to perform uh, or outperform average um, diversity teams, uh, and the same with increased gender diversity comes increased likelihood of financial outperformance because there's better innovation. Uh, something that helped me understand the why was this uh, graph or explanation from the book Rebel Ideas by Matthew Said, which I recommend reading if you want to know more about the, what, you know, the benefits about it. Um, and usually when we work in tech or any other area, we have problems we're trying to solve, whether that's how to improve a product, how to make things go faster, how to put together good teams. And what we usually try to do is we put in an expert. And then over time, we try to add more experts because usually the space, the problem we're trying to solve is the bigger than the knowledge of one person. So what often happens is we find this one person, they're really smart, they're really good at what they do. And then we say like, wow, this person's amazing at their job, let's get more people. But then often we bring in people that think the same because they bring the same expertise to it. But what that does to our problem space is we now have maybe seven experts, but the distribution of their experiences and their knowledge is quite similar. So what happens is they reinforce each other's um, um, biases and they might not they might share the same blind spots. So while the work feels frictionless, often we don't really get closer to solving more of the problem. Whereas if we introduce seven experts with quite different viewpoints and experiences that also obviously have expertise in this problem space we're trying to solve, we sometimes get a lot better coverage. And it can feel, um, while we're in the space, like there's more friction, like it's more difficult, but it is because we are able to point out when we have blind spots and when we have biases. So I hope that explanation um, helps you all a little bit. Uh, and I also find it very exciting to work in the space and make these new experiences because it also helped me question and um, interrogate my own vision, my own perspective, and what really matters to me. So it's also exciting personal growth um, experiences. Um, okay, so this is all nice and well. Uh, it definitely has benefits, but how do we do it? Uh, when I was asked to give this talk, I was like, oh no, people are going to expect me to come up here and give you like the three bullet points on how you can fix it. And I'm sad to report, it's really that simple. And if it was, um, A, I would be making a lot of money and I wouldn't be here. And, and B, if anyone tells you they have the three-step solution to fix all your diversity problems, they're probably exaggerating or slightly um, you know, delusional. But I found a really helpful framework that um, after my experiences and all the things that I did that failed, <laughs> uh, that really helps me put things into context. And I'm going to share the framework in general with you now and uh, explain it on the examples of hiring and retention with you later. So when we approach DNI challenges, I would go about it quite similar to how you would approach other challenges you're facing in the business. The first thing is the cold hard facts and the data. So some people of you might be like, yeah, that's more my ballpark. I know how to do data. We do the same about DEI. Uh, we might do surveys where we try co co to collect quantitative data, like what is my workforce made out of? How is the representation compared to the wider uh, country that I live in? Um, we might also do quanti uh, qualitative surveys, like how do we, people feel about their progression? Do they have a sense of belonging? Do they feel they can speak about problems? How's their relationship to their manager, to the senior management team? And just try to assess how do people feel within my company? 
Um, and sometimes we might also just go back on research that's widely available um, from other areas or our sector. The second step we want to take once we gathered all the data is we want to try to make sense of it and then set ourselves measurable goals because that's something I notice a lot where companies fail. We often say, oh, we just want to be more inclusive. But what does that mean if you tell people in your organization, help, help us be more diverse or inclusive? What, what does that mean? What does it look like in numbers? If you're not specific, you run the danger of people just running away with their own interpretations or people discarding it because they don't know how to solve it. So work with various stakeholders, not just your C-level teams, but with people if you're trying to, for example, re increase representation of a certain minority background, then work with them. Talk to them, figure out, you know, how would you like us to approach this? What, what, you know, what is good ways to interact with you? And if you don't have these people internally, either because you might have some, but they don't want to get engaged, um, we'll get to this problem later, or you might not even have any representation at all. So you can also work with export or voluntary boards or focus groups. So there's always lots of ways to involve shareholders. You want to make your goals measurable because if you can't measure your progress, you won't be. You won't know if you're running, if you're doing it right. You won't know if you're doing it wrong, and you won't be able to hold yourself accountable. And you want to define success clearly. After so and so much time, what does success look like? Then you go out to implement the things, and this is where it gets interesting because you have now defined your goals, but now you need to make clear who do we involve with making these goals happen, who is responsible for it, and how do we measure this? And that's another issue that I often see. We, we often say, okay, we want to increase our retention or we want to improve things on diversity. And maybe we even got to the point where we say, okay, we want to get 30% more women with the hiring spree next year. But then we don't say who's accountable for that. What happens if we don't reach those targets? How do we support people to actually reach those things? So you need to set expectations. Who's involved of the stakeholders? What, what are the metrics we're trying to hit? And then, very important, put in the support, put in systems to back up what you're trying to reach. You can't just ask people to do these things. You need to give them training. You need to give them resources. You need to give them time. Um, if, if you don't tie it in with real world you know, goals that your company tries to track, it's always going to be the first thing that goes out of the window when something else is on fire. So make sure it is connected to your business challenges and opportunities because it has as much an impact as some other bus business aspects you're trying to do. And the last thing is you track and check your data. You make sure you're on the right path. You celebrate wins, which is also important. You need to pause and see what worked and then you know, increase the scope of it. Uh, but sometimes you might also have to course correct or stay accountable and say it didn't work like we wanted it to, but be quite honest and transparent about it. Before I show you how to practically put that into place, I'll um, hop to the next slide and share with you first the blockers and challenges I personally encountered a lot and had to learn about. Most of it is psychology, some of it is just an attitude and mindset thing, and I hope these help you a little bit because a lot of them I had to learn the hard way, and I hope I can shorten that learning curve for you a bit or give you some starting points. The first thing is trust. I found this really good quote after I put together my slides, so I made space for it. Um, and it is, trust is the currency of change. If you want to make substantial changes to the makeup of your company, your culture, how you treat people, people need to trust you. Otherwise, you won't even get, get it off the ground. Uh, and how do you know that? Um, how do you know that people don't trust you? If you already do things like employee, um, I don't know, satisfaction surveys where you try to measure that and you don't get a lot of engagement, maybe just 40% of your workforce tell you how they feel within the business and those of those 40, some of them might even be quite cynical. That's because they don't trust you. Um, and that's quite hard to swallow as a leader um, of any movement. So um, knowing, okay, trust is an substantial thing we need to fix is good and clear, but how do we do it? Uh, what really helped me is understanding the framework of how trust comes to be. Uh, so trust is made out of four building blocks. The first thing that decides whether I trust a person uh, in an interpersonal relationship is often the easiest to fix is, do I care? Does this person care about me beyond what I can do for them? It's often hard to do in a business context because we know at the end of the day, if some big decisions get made and people get made redundant, suddenly all the care of the world might go out of the building, even if they personally care. So you might need to think about how can you build care into your processes? How can you make sure that people trust their managers and that the managers trust you and so on and show that you care? 
Next thing is sincerity. Does the person mean what they talk about and is it based on research and fact? So if, you, if you're a leader and you've always like never taken a, taken a stance on diversity and inclusion and suddenly you're like, oh, this is the most important thing ever, people might be, hmm, are they just parroting someone or do they believe it? So if you believe this, be sincere, share your why's uh, and show people how they can connect to you and also do your research and see why your reasoning is based on facts. Reliability. How likely is this person to follow up with what they promised? That's another thing I see a lot. We, you know, companies often, when they have a bit of a downtime, they're like, okay, let's make this better, let's improve it, we're gonna change everything, and then nothing happens. And then they do this again, and again, and again. And every time you do it and you don't follow through, you lose a little bit of trust. So sometimes what you have to go do first is get back to that stage and show that you can deliver on the things you promised. And the last one is competence. So it might be you leave, you care, you might be sincere, you might even be reliable usually when you promise something, but do I believe you are capable of doing the change? And you can tackle that by, for example, um, bringing on experts and see, show how they kind of connect to your work and how they can help you accomplish what to do. So if you notice you really struggle to even talk about the basic things of company culture with your teams and get, get any change done, trust is what you might want to look into first. The second one, and it's a difficult one to swallow and an even more difficult one to combat, is shame is an ineffective tool for behavioral change. Um, if any of you have been like I am, if you are a lot online, you see a lot of discourses, whether it's about diversity in the business or just in general politics, we often use labels, we sling them around freely and widely. And most of us do this because we really strongly believe in things and we think, oh, if only we could make the other people see why we care about this. So we often put on labels on them and chain them and think, oh, well, you know, once they realized they're doing all this bad stuff, they're gonna go away and they're gonna change. However, that's not how it works. It's not only mean, it does not work. So why it shame doesn't work is A, it stops people from believing they can change, they can do better. If I realize, oh, I did a bad thing, and that had a negative impact, next time I'll do better, that might motivate me to change. If someone says, I am bad, I can't change in their eyes, there's no reason for me to get invested. The second thing, if we go into shame mode, our brain either goes to fight, so we get defensive, or we might fling some accusations back, or we might go into fright mode, we might be really withdrawn, we might get just, oh no, I didn't mean it like that, and we, we don't focus really on the actual problem. Or we go into freeze and we stop engaging with the topic altogether. So in all these cases, shame takes us away from where we want to go. Also, shame makes us focus on the self. We are focused on how other people perceive us. They're like, oh my god, they think I'm a bad person. We don't think about the harm that our action has maybe caused to the other person. That's a different emotion and that's guilt. And the sooner you also learn to spot shame in yourself, like if the discussions get hard and you get defensive, maybe just because you are ashamed or you're worried that people think badly about you. So learning to spot that, take a deep breath and go like, okay, what's actually going on is incredibly hard. And I'd be hypocritical if I said I had that down. I don't, but it's good to know about. And what is the antidote to shame? It's empathy. And I always have mixed feelings talk about empathy because often we also use this tool to go like, well, obviously clearly their intentions were good, so you should be empathetic. And then that person, that action might still have hurt someone. So we need to be careful how we use empathy and that we don't weaponize it. We need to make sure that sometimes both parties in an argument or situation need empathy and we need different spaces that can provide that empathy, different people that can provide that care and not ask the people in conflict to do that. Um, but how do we do that and why is it so difficult? So the problem is most of us aren't really equipped through the way we were brought up, through the way we used to teach, to speak to each other without using judgment. <laughs> so sometimes, or without empathy, because it's not how we're designed to talk and to think, especially not in a business context where we're trying to be professional and detached and maybe not bring our emotions in. So you might, for yourself and for your wider teams, need new frameworks of communication that you bring into your culture, that you teach people how you expect them to talk to each other. Uh, I personally am a big fan of nonviolent communication. I did as a leader um, and manager, a lot of workshops on communication. I really like learning, so I do all of them. If they're free, I go. Um, this is the one I personally keep returning to just because it tries to remove judgment from the language when we express ourselves and it focuses on emotions and basic human needs because these are universals. We all have very different values, so what's more important to us, but we all share the same needs. And if you can learn to listen to people and when they're angry, try to listen behind the unmet needs behind that, 
you have a better chance of actually being able to listen and also to react positively. So you might need this tool. If you don't click with it, there's lots of other ones. I'll link them all in the slides if you want to have a, digger, a deeper dig, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and the next um, difficulty about diversity and inclusion is you need to learn to navigate the paradox. Like I said, it's a messy field, it's not always easy, and it can be at times really hard, because sometimes when we run into an issue, when something bad happens in the world, some people will tell you, we need to speak up, we need to make a statement, and others need to tell you, we need to shut up, we have no say in this. Uh, some people don't want to be put in a box, and other people, you know, they say, oh, you know, I don't want to talk about color, I'm color blind. But then other people say, but my, you know, my skin and how I'm perceived in the world is part of my identity. Um, so you need to learn to navigate the paradox. You need to learn to hold complex ideas uh, and both at the same time as truth in your head. Also, you need to learn how to deal with missteps and focus on the outcomes. You know, Don't let the discourse change you completely from what you're trying to achieve and in, when in doubt, return to the goals you set yourself. Okay, and the last thing I want to share before I go into um, very concrete examples is everyone can be a part of changes. So because I mentioned the C-suite a few times in the leadership level, but I don't want every one of you who is not in that position to tune out. Um, and that's something I had to learn. So the more you understand how power works and how influence works, the more effectively can you do this work and contribute to it. So some of you might be in leadership levels of some level, maybe even all the way to the top. So you have the power to make decisions and have others ad adhere to it, whether that's through hierarchy, whether that's to punitive measures you can put in place or incentives. But you might also have perspectives and insights that others might miss. Um, I noticed that when I did my DEI leadership for the first few years, I did that and I felt I had no power, but actually I, over time, built a lot of expertise and people came to me to get my perspective on questions they had no insights on. And later, I even established some um, mentoring with, with the CEO where we mentored each other, basically, and talked about, I, I get to better understand the issues that senior leadership faces and they got to better understand how, for example, volunteering influenced hindered my progress because I was doing all this volunteer work, which meant I was not able to progress in my career and learn an extra coding language or whatever. Some of you might just be well connected. If you are a person that speaks with a lot of departments and you see someone who's trying to affect some change, you might not be the person to help them make that change happen. But you might very well know someone. You might someone who might understand their course. You might someone who is in a higher position of power. You can connect them through. So you can just be the bonding element between them and help them forge coalitions. Or you can just be a supporter of the course, back it when it becomes important, or be the person who explains things and helps offer resources. There's lots of ways of getting involved, um, and it's important to understand that and don't feel deterred. And if you don't understand that, there's um, some really good resources I'll share afterwards about the different types of power that you can delve into deeper. Okay, I talked very fast. I'm sorry. I do that when I get nervous. Um, but this is time to take a breath uh, because I taught you a lot about how can you approach a problem and what are some of the blockers and common issues we face. But I'm still talking theoreticals. So let's finally look at what I promised you in the title, hiring and retention. Hiring and retention is a really nice one. I accidentally, I didn't really put much thought into it when I picked it for this talk, but as I mapped it out, I was like, ah, oh, that's a nice process because it's quite linear. You start with a job being posted, uh, the applications come in, then you usually have some filters. You might, you know, just get only maybe 50% of the CVs you receive will even go to the hiring managers. Then you select who you want to meet for interviews, then you assess people, then once you pick your favorite, you give an offer, uh, and then once they're there, you're on the retention side of things. You onboard people, you try to bring them into the culture, which maybe you put a lot of effort into designing, so you want to make sure they find their footing, they understand how you operate, how they can succeed within your business. Um, then they do their work and pay, and you also need to track how enabled are they to do their work, what are blockers they get in their way, is their pay fair, and promotions, and so on. So on a high level, it's a really nice process, but this is where the good thing about the framework we discussed earlier come in. We can look at any bit of this aspect and start digging in and start making some plans. So for example, let's look at the very beginning, the job being posted. 
Our first step, like I said, is collecting data. So that might look like where are our job posts even shared, like which boards are we using? If we have data available from that, what user base do, user base do we know we can reach there? Um, how long are our postings live? How accessible is our application process? Who is this being pushed to? So you might do a bit of digging and a bit of research, and then you might, for example, find, okay, so the users we reach with our tech roles are 80%. I put in status quo here so you can insert anything. If you mostly have a company or a team filled with men, it might be that it's mostly men. Um, or statistics show we have a 50% viewing rate from people from a marginalized background, but very few of them actually apply. So we might want to dig deeper into it. But for the next example, I'll just use um, the first scenario where we notice we mostly, mostly people that we already have a lot of in the company see these types of postings. So now we get to the second stage where we create goals and accountability. So the goal might be quite clear. So currently our status is that, I don't know, 20% of the viewers that see our job postings are, for example, women. Uh, by the end of the year, we want this to be increased to 30 or 40% with an overall viewer increase by 50% because, you know, we don't want less men to see the ad. We need to be specific about that. We want to make sure that more women see it and more people see it overall. And then we go to creating accountability uh, and say, okay, how does senior leadership make sure that this happens? If we have employee resource groups, how can they feed into this? How do other teams feed into this? For example, hiring managers might be responsible for investigating the wording or the talent acquisition team might be responsible for recommending some specialists that you could work with. Then you roll it out to the wider company, you share what you're trying to achieve and how you will support people achieve that and that's important. You can't just expect people to go do it on top of all their workload. You need to be quite um, intentional and you need to understand it takes time and it takes energy to do these things, especially if it's new to them. So. To improve our ad viewing rates by a certain background, we will do the following things. This ties into a wider mission of, I don't know, improving our company culture or makeup of our teams. To enable teams to do this work, we've put together the following resources so you can take a training here or you can uh, read the following blogs or you can make time to build some strategy groups to investigate a certain area you said you're responsible for. And we are open for feedback through this process through you know, using this form or speaking to your line manager or whatever is true. So at this step, you want to create transparency. You want to be quite open about what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to make it happen. Share your expectations, offer support. And if at this stage, you might also want to go back to what I shared with you earlier. If people react badly to it, Maybe you don't have the trust yet. Maybe you don't have to buy in yet. So maybe you want to focus on this first. If you use very shaming messages to get people on board, like, oh, you know, you're all terrible because you never managed to do this on yourself. Why do we have to set these goals? No one's going to want to help you. So try to give people an opportunity to see themselves as a positive part of a positive change that will benefit everyone. And also, you know, how are you communicating this and tying it into your overall strategy? Does it make sense for you? And lastly, you want to then track and stay accountable. So, for example, you noticed your first win. You noticed that the hiring team managed to forge a strategic partnership with um, a nonprofit and maybe with another college or something where they started going to more, uh, you know, to specific days. And this, this way they managed to increase the viewers rate from the target group who so many percent. So celebrate wins and make time to say, this is what good looks like. This is fantastic. Um, and thank you for doing it. And also stay accountable and transparent when things don't go this way. Another thing I often notice is people are really afraid to share when things don't go their way. They're, they'd rather hush it all up. But you wouldn't do the same thing if you had problems with your traffic or whatever issues you face, if you know user speed went down, you wouldn't just say, oh, I don't want to share that with everyone. I don't want people to know that things aren't going. You want your whole engineer team to know this is a problem and we need to solve it together. And it hasn't happened, so we need a new approach. This is why it's important to stay you know, vocal about it and share when things go well and also not well. And this is how you build trust by keeping up this accountability and sharing these things. Um, and we can do the same now for the application process. I'm going to do this one a bit quicker because I don't want to bore you. So again, we might look at the application stage now and we might notice 
we, we are quite confident now that a lot of people can see our ads, but we still only get the same types of applicants. So you might look either to your own research or to studies. For example, some studies show that people of color and often also women tend to only apply to roles if they meet 100% of the criteria that's displayed in the roles. So that means um, you might have not by design, but by accident, by not paying attention to your wording, excluded people and stopped people from applying. So now you have your data. Now you set yourself some measurable goals. Um, you know, we want to increase applicants from a certain background by so and so much percent by 2023. <laughs> um, you want to then find your stakeholders uh, and put in support in place. For example, one support might look like we hired a specialist that will help us analyze our job postings. Um, and this last one is a thing I'm often, it's like a pet peeve of mine because I work in the games industry and I work a lot with people who are trying to apply for games. And it happens so easily in processes that people just throw in, oh, and we want you to have a degree in this. And when you ask, Do, did I need a degree? I was like, yeah, it would be nice to have. Is it a nice to have or is it a requirement? And what, what do you mean when you want them to have a degree? Or we want to know that you know, they can learn a coding language and they can do some research and write about it. It's like, write that instead. Because you might have people out there who meet all these criteria, but they don't have a degree. And if they see that, they might just take themselves out before you even get to speak to them and you might miss out on some fantastic talent. So, you know, th and there's different things you can do. This is just one example. You might want to look at what you're actually already doing. You can look at best practices. You can get help from specialists. And then again, track your progress and check and share. Share what happens when you don't meet your targets and how are you going to tackle that issue coming forth with. Uh, so now, after I talked a lot again, uh, I'll give you a second to just maybe think about your own processes, whether you designed them or whether you went through them by applying. Is there any area of your job application that you never really thought much about where it might filter out people? Is there something you found a bit weird when you applied for a job? And what, what could you do about it? How could you raise it? How could you bring that up? Okay. Okay. And then lastly, oh, I actually managed through the slides without running out of time. Fantastic. I'll just go to summarize this for you. So first, uh, by orientating ourselves on measurable data, actual goals and outcomes, we can create accountability and change. It sounds slow, and it is slow, but at least it's sustainable, at least it works. A one-off intervention will not work. Giving people one-off bias training can sometimes do more harm than good. You can also look up the research on that. Um, you'll, while you do this work, you'll be surrounded by paradoxes. So learn to listen humbly, but still stay on course. Don't get distracted too much. When you set your goals, try to hold yourself accountable for what's feasible, because if you overload yourself with all your ambitions and then in the end end up doing nothing, that's you know worse than doing something and then doing the next thing after another. If you do these changes to your culture, I mean, we just talked about the hiring process. You often don't just make it better for the people from the certain backgrounds you're trying to help. You make it better for everyone. If you manage to build an organization where people trust each other more, where people give better feedback, where people communicate better, you will increase your products, your workforce, how people feel about working for you, and everything at the same time. So it doesn't only benefit minorities, it benefits everyone. Um, trust is very necessary. Oh, no, and I also forgot that everyone can influence changes. Yes. <laughs> so you all can make a part, be a part of the change and contribute to it, whether you feel you are affected by it or not, because you all can help if you want to. Um, trust is necessary, um, and you might want, need to start a trust. If people don't trust you, that's hard, but that's something you can also tackle and grow. Shame is an ineffective tool for sustainable change, and it doesn't work as much as we want it to. Communication requires intention, it can be improved, and getting help is normal. If you try to fix traffic or whatever you're trying to solve in your company and you don't have the talent, you would hire a contractor, you'd get help. No one is automatically a specialist in this, and you can do the same here. And by the way, not selling myself, I'm not, a, um, not someone who can help you with this, uh, so I'm not doing this to advertise and saying this to normalize getting help. Okay, and overall, you've got this. So last steps, I made these slides available, so if you scan the QR code, or I'm also talking to the organizers later, you can also look up the uh, slides itself, and I put some resources for you if you want to delve deeper into any of these topics. Uh, you can find some books or courses or whatever to do my research. And lastly, thank you. And please talk to me. I don't know anyone aside from the, one of the organizers. So if you see me around later and I look a bit lost, feel free to say hi and talk to me about DEI. That's it. <laughs> okay.
nein, nein. Du <lacht> Ah. Yeah, welcome. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the nice talk and the nice summary at the end. Uh, at least uh, you can say few now because now you can uh, breathe a bit. Uh, but uh, I hope there are some questions here in the audience. It might also be easier if you want to come to me afterwards. I'm happy to no, talk. No, it's actually not a question. It's actually okay. more an observation I have. Um, actually, what we said in the panel discussion that uh, there's the management level and the people actually working in the company that they have different. Um, they see these these things totally different. They talk also differently in the upper level and the lower level. So what they uh, propagate normally for the lower level, they do not do in the upper level. And the second thing you mentioned, questionnaires in companies, and out of my, out of my experience I would say don't trust them. Actually, um, they get a target, also the external companies who make actually a report out of it, they get the target, that what what's, uh, is actually the result of the questionnaire, and then the questionnaire is formed in a way that the result is reached. Mm -hmm. So trust your instincts, that's my point. If you see there's something on out of balance, you're normally right. That's my point. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, there's a raising hand from be behind. Oh, oh, one there first. But I think we are on time constraints, so only the next questions. Okay, so then one question is, is a comment also allowed? <laughs> I think you already made a comment, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right. Um, so what what I also wanted to say is like uh, if management is uh, not able to understand what uh, diversity brings to the team, uh, they cannot. I, I mean, it will never work. You have all these frameworks set up, and you can measure that something goes wrong. Um, they they need to. Uh, celebrate uh, it also in a certain way. So I know one company, for example, that is doing, uh, that is with every new uh, hire, they're celebrating like how many different nationalities they are having mm. now. So, I mean, that's pretty amazing if a company can do that. But if the managers go out and don't understand, like, for example, they hire in our white Caucasian, uh, sorry, uh, male Caucasian um, uh, main community, they start to hire uh, people f uh, with, uh, for example, uh, uh, who are who are Muslims, and they don't know how to do um, uh, how, uh, understand nothing about uh, um, uh, about um, um, uh, Ramadan, for example, yeah. right? Um, it's not possible that they know why, uh, why uh, what effort they put into, it and in which situation the uh, people in the team are. So. It, they, they will never become part of the team if 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 um, if that is not uh, part of the um, of the of the whole uh, communication that you have. Yeah, thanks Inside. for sharing that. I had to cut that from brevity because I'd also say start with your culture first before you hire because you don't want to throw people into an environment that's going to be hostile to them because you haven't fixed the actual you know culture. So it's a good observation. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, we have. Yeah, uh, <coughs> more. <coughs> more, more. Yeah, uh, just just two comments. First off, the slides will be published, so uh, you can go get all those resources on uh, githubcom slash dinox slash media. And uh, also, thank you, Susie, and she does also speak excellent German besides her way better English than mine, so uh, feel free to reach out to her. <laughs> I would have a question for Susie for next year. We had a very successful panel discussion this morning. Would it be of interest to have a panel discussion about this topic on the second day next Dinox? What do you think? I think this is a yes, and uh, maybe you have time to join us there. Thank you very much, Susie.